Welcome to the Australian Bitcoin Podcast. Today, your hosts are Jeremy and Daniel. Daniel, how are you today? Yeah, very well. And uh, looking forward to speaking with today's guest. I'm doing myself very well. It's uh, spring and here. The weather's getting nice. Yeah, it's nice being able to get outside again and not feel that cold wind. And wearing shorts in the office again is always a plus. Mm. Well, today's guest is uh, Bosch, which is a pseudonym. And Bosch is a, he's based in Australia and he's a Bitcoin designer. So he does design work. Uh, on Bitcoin projects. Uh, we're really pleased to have him on as a guest. Uh, he had so much to talk about that we didn't get through all of our questions. You still had a heap of questions to ask him, but we um, had to had to cut it off um, to be conscious of time. Um, so yeah, it's a really great episode. I think everyone will, will, uh, will enjoy it. Before we do that, let's just a quick ch- note from our show sponsor. Uh, Hutlock is Australia's oldest Bitcoin-only exchange established in 2014. Featuring automated DCA with 99 SAT withdrawals, dedicated SMSF accounts and Bitcoin customer support. To find out more, email hello at hardblock.com.au or sign up with the link in the show notes for free automated Bitcoin withdrawals for six months. All right, let's speak to Bosch. G'day, Bosch. How are you? Yeah, good. How are you guys? Yeah, pretty good. Thanks very much for joining us. So we've got Daniel and myself, Jeremy here. Um, and we're just very interested to uh, go through some of the um, different things that you're working on. You've got quite a few different things you're working on and... Um, in a different area than what we probably talk talk about normally. Normally, we're sort of more in the coding area, and today is a bit different. So I'm, I'm excited to to uh, to dig into some of that stuff. So just before we get started in what you're doing in Bitcoin, though, can you give us an idea of your background, like you know your education, work experience, as much as you want to share? With yeah, us? sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so well, I'll get to the stuff that I kind of do with Bitcoin. So um, we'll get to that a bit later. But I guess going back in my history experience, it's a bit different. I come from a completely different field from anything related to Bitcoin. So previously, uh, before working in Bitcoin, I was kind of in the biotech space. So right. studied like pharmacology at university. I was going to go to med school, but didn't end up going. You know, just kind of chop and change in paths like you do when you're at university. Um, but whilst I was at university, uh, kind of ended up doing a little bit of coding and stuff like on the side as well as uh, things like that. Um, as well as while I was at university, I also got quite involved in the startup kind of ecosystem. So there was a lot of overlap with uh, developers and tech people, but I was interested in it initially from like more of a biotech kind of point of view. Mm-hmm. And um, my kind of ambitions were like when I was at uni was to kind of start my own thing. That's kind of what I've always wanted to do, still want to do it. And uh, I kind of was trying to do a few startups here and there. I had a few attempts at like some biotech startups whilst I was a student. Um, you know, it took big gap years and stuff like that off uni and worked on those and did a bunch of stuff around like uh, primarily to do with like fungus and uh, genetics around fungus, you know, um, it was quite varied, I guess, depend uh, what I did. Like I was working on making some uh, like hemostat applications to so like stop bleeding and stuff like that, like medical appliances, uh, building like uh, biomaterials with fungus, stuff like that. Did lots of little things. Didn't really get too far into like raising money and stuff like that, but I got, I got a bit of traction and they were cool projects and they were pretty interesting and did a lot of talks and stuff in my local city about stuff that I was working on. Um, but uh, eventually kind of just ended up not going through with like, you know, doing med school and continuing university, kind of didn't want to spend another six, seven years studying. Mm-hmm. wasn't really for me. Uh, it never was really for me. Didn't really like a university uh, mm-hmm. as a whole. Um, but fortunately, yeah, doing the whole startup kind of stuff uh, definitely got me into the tech world, was doing a bit of software development on the side as well as product design, ended up, you know, when you start a startup you're kind of aware of many hats so Mm -hmm. you know got first-hand experience like running your own thing doing product management uh product development product design uh dev mostly like front-end stuff not a whole lot of back-end um but yeah that gave me a lot of experience that kind of i guess led the foundations that kind of led to where i am now which i'm sure we'll get into a bit later um yeah for sure but yeah, I guess that's kind of my background in a bit of a nutshell, a um, bit of a different. So did kind of- you, because you, you talked about all your education was in like biology type stuff, like medicine and um, pharmacy type things. And yet somehow you, or had you jumped into, uh, you did some software development. So did you have a background, like technical background prior to that? Or how did you make that jump so quickly? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't actually. So um, 
these days when I was, I was studying uh, biotechnology genetics, so there was components of it where we did software development, like uh, you okay. know, to do okay. data, data processing, like with Python scripts yep. and stuff like that. So yep. I got into it, got first hand on it. And I, I always did have a, like, I guess an affinity for computers and technology, but I never dove into it to like any great degree. Tried my hand at coding a few times when I was a teenager and stuff like that, but didn't really like it. Um, but yeah, I did get, got some first hand experience with that and yeah, yeah, while I was doing the startup stuff, um, majority of the people that I hanged out with, I was probably the only person doing like biotech startup stuff. Like as a uni student, we hang, we always hang out at like you know uh, uni student incubators and stuff like that. Pretty much everyone yeah. else there was a developer and worked in tech, and obviously hanging out with them all the time. You just kind of pick stuff up and learn things, and end up going to a lot of coding stuff. And yeah, it was pretty. It would have been pretty lonely, I think, if I stayed just doing biotech by myself. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, and then, then when did Bitcoin come along for you? Oh, sorry, can I just push you? Have you so have you started with these funded startups or? Um, so one of them I did raise a small amount of capital. It was just yeah. like kind of pre-seed stuff, but didn't really go too far with it. It was it was one of those things where I kind of. Uh, I oh, know there was a few barriers anyways that I didn't really want to deal with being so young because I was probably like 20 years old, 21 years old at the time. And there's just a whole lot of red tape and regulation and like building something in biotech, like unlike, you know, software, you know, you're looking at five, six years of like building something, going through a bunch of red tape, regulation. I also didn't have like a PhD or hadn't even finished my undergrad when I was doing this stuff. So a lot of people didn't really like respect you or listen to your opinions and stuff like that. So it was just a whole lot of like you know, crap like that that I really wasn't too interested in dealing with and I just kind of got disheartened it over time um, and yeah, ended up parting ways with the project. But yeah. Okay, and then from there, um, yeah, so at what point did you get into Bitcoin? Was it soon after that? Uh, yeah, so actually when I was so when I was doing all this tech stuff and hanging out all these incubators and all these tech guys uh, were there, I was just fortunate enough, one of the guys who worked out of a co-working space that I worked in uh, was actually heavily involved in Bitcoin development, like more specifically mm -hmm. like Bitcoin core developer, uh, development. Right, cool. So we became good friends and like I had kind of known about Bitcoin. Like this is back, you know, 2014, 15. Like I knew what it was and, you know, a lot of kids at the time, you know, buy stuff online like that they shouldn't be behind like when I was at uni and stuff like that. And there was obviously a lot of hype around that with Silk Road and things. So knew of it, was aware of it, um, hadn't really dived into it. I uh, met this guy at these co-working spaces who worked on it full time. And I guess I was pretty lucky to meet him because, you know, I got mm. to miss all the, you know, shitcoin kind of phase and yep. skipped all that and just went straight into the, the Bitcoin side of it. Can you, and, say, um, sorry, sorry? Can, can, can you say who it was? Uh, yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Um, it was Fanquake. He's a Bitcoin Core maintainer. So, which is really surprising because, like, we're in a, a very uh, uh, isolated city over here in Perth, Australia. So it's pretty pretty cool that there's you know someone working on some uh, pretty cool software of Bitcoin regarding that. But but yeah, he kind of got me into it, and like we, we we're also really good friends too. So like you know, uh, it was really good to have him as like I guess someone to kind of listen to and uh, roll questions by and stuff like that and obviously yeah he was quite experienced um and at the time like i didn't really have a lot of whole lot of economics uh education as well so i had the yeah obviously i had biotech and i had a bit of tech background but then the next two years from like there i pretty much spent most of my time like really diving into the nitty-gritty economics finance like previously i kind of thought those fields were a little bit boring like mm -hmm. i didn't think they were that like sexy but uh yep after getting into Bitcoin like, I've, and learning about them, I actually, yeah, I've actually grown to really like, you know, those fields. And I think they're really interesting. And I honestly think these days people should be, uh, you know, not forced isn't the good word, but it should be mandated in schools instead of like, you know, some other classes they mandate people to take yeah, and stuff like that. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and so did you get it straight away or did you need some convincing? Um, I, would, I, did, I definitely, definitely didn't get it in its full capacity. I would say previously I was always, I guess, a libertarian type person. I never would have used that label maybe until I got into Bitcoin, which got me into economics and politics. But mm -hmm. I guess I was like a nature, like a, I guess, a libertarian person type, uh, type person. Like, you know, I guess I'm pretty disagreeable as a person and things like that. I, I don't know if that makes you <laughs> like yep. a libertarian, but I think many people are like that. But just growing up as a kid, I think I was like that, you know, I like, didn't listen to my parents and stuff a whole lot, I guess. But I think that um, 
was like a big reason that I kind of maybe got it a bit quicker than other people. Like it kind of the the philosophy that underpinned it, like you know Austrian economics and all that, kind of clicked really quickly with me. The whole ideas behind it, um, they. Yeah, so I guess I kind of had some foundations already laid out, even though I didn't know it. And then when I started learning about it, it made sense. And yeah, um, I've always kind of been someone who's pretty pro like freedom, privacy, you know, being a sovereign individual, stuff like that. So, okay, cool. I mean, I think that um, desire to go straight to a startup out of uni aligns pretty well with the Bitcoin ethos. I think a lot of other people will probably be looking at a job for someone else and you've, you've gone straight to a startup. So that's a pretty good alignment there. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. Just for reference, okay. that's uh, that's kind of my journey also. I pretty much went straight into Bitcoin after uni. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. And yeah, everyone thought it was really stupid, but, you know, I didn't care. Was, mm. Mum and dad still think it's pretty stupid, but yeah. <laughs> I don't understand, I don't understand yeah. it. But, I think yeah, I've got the same problem. Story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I saw this story, uh, I mentioned this story before, but um, around 2000, um, uh, 15 in the bear market M- um, my mother wanted to take me to a therapist because she thought I was too obsessed with Bitcoin and the <laughs> price was obviously going down um, yeah. yeah how do you feel about that these days? Uh, she doesn't mention it anymore she's pretty happy <laughs> yeah. only when the price is down she probably mentions it but. <laughs> yeah. okay so you had tried some startups you were sort of finishing uni you discovered bitcoin through this um bitcoin core developer which is an awesome connection to have so what happened next um so actually i guess um well i previously said i didn't do any shit coining but i guess i may have done a tiny bit but i guess <laughs> i think yeah, everyone there's, there's a done. there was a friend of mine who uh uh he was another developer who I met uh, in the same kind of circles. He was pretty into cryptocurrency. This is when like the Ethereum ICO was out, I think roughly. So like, you know, right. got on, well, got on, okay. we both got on that and ended up going all right. And we both, he ended up leaving uni as well. I'd already kind of left uni, but like gave us, you know, a bit of a wiggle room to kind of just do what we wanted. And uh, at the time, like uh, my big, my biggest kind of issue I had with Bitcoin was its lack of privacy. I was a, uh, pretty concerned with that still think there's a lot of issues there today but mm. i understand a bit more clearly now why you know the blockchain or the bitcoin blockchain is the way it is and why it isn't so private and i, I kind of agree with those things but i think things are improving um but i ended up yeah dabbling with like monero a bit it was only cryptocurrency okay. I think, outside of bitcoin that i quite liked um community was great um i think it was had a lot of really similar ethos to bitcoin never really dabbled in any other community like i bought some like shit coins and stuff but i never cared about them like i didn't really get around ethereum and stuff like that yeah. me and my me and my friend uh just like wanted to do a little side project like uh while we we're kind of just hanging out and we ended up building a, a small like peer-to-peer monero exchange so same as local bitcoins but you could oh, really? uh, you well. know trade trade monero for cash and stuff like that yeah. um just felt like there was a small opportunity there definitely wasn't looking at it as like a you know big kind of startup end goal it was more just something like oh we're interested in cryptocurrencies both like privacy and stuff quite a lot and was got in, reasonably involved in like the monero community and stuff like that and um yeah just did that as a little bit of a project for maybe about a year or so and then um also whilst i was doing this like you know was doing starting to contribute to like various open source projects in bitcoin so I did that for like a year and then that kind of fizzled out. My friend ended up moving over to Thailand, just wanted to chill mm-hmm. out and not really work on anything. So we just kind of parted ways on that and stopped working on it. Um, but yeah, while I was doing all that, working on open source, ended up like, I guess, building up a, a reputation, meeting people in the communities and just kind of like, you know, spend a lot of time on Bitcoin Twitter and stuff, like I'm sure many people do. Yeah. And um, I guess that reputation kind of built up, led to where I am today. Um, I didn't know like what exactly path I was going to take, but I knew I wanted to work like in Bitcoin. Like that was kind of my mm-hmm. um, and aspirations. But um, yeah, eventually got there, which is where I am today, which is which is awesome. But yeah. Just before we jump into that, so a Monero tip for cash peer-to-peer exchange, that would be like the most threatening thing for the government. Did you have any regu- regulatory challenges around that? that uh, might, like, not, really. not really. Not really, no. Like, um, th- there's, one, too early. there's one that exists today, I think, still called Local Monero. So okay. they, they've been operating. They launched probably not too long after we stopped working on our project. And I yeah. think they've been working pretty fine. But um, I think the liquidity is just probably not that great in a Monero for them to 
uh, authorities mm-hmm. to really care so so much at the moment. But yeah. but yeah, there wasn't like at the time. I feel like it was well, it wasn't whether it was Nero or Bitcoin regulators didn't like cryptocurrencies in general. Like they were yeah. still, yeah. you know, this was like 2016, 17, and like like it still had a pretty bad reputation as being known as the Silk Road drug kind of currency. So yeah, it wasn't a yeah, it wasn't a exactly the best, anyways. So. Okay, so then after the Monero exchange, then then what happened? Um, yeah, so I started just pretty much contributing to. Well, I was doing this whilst doing the Monero exchange. Started contributing to open source. Um, mm-hmm. My first kind of project I dabbled in was trying to do Bitcoin Core stuff. I didn't really mm-hmm. get right into the consensus like C plus uh, plus that side of it. But I started uh, working on the graphical user interface whilst mm-hmm. I was doing my biotech startup. I did quite a bit of like product design, and I quite liked it. Like it, it was, it, I, I found it more enjoyable than like coding and stuff like that all day yep. and slowly kind of started drifting more towards product design and i'm a big fan of like art and stuff like that mm-hmm. so it kind mm-hmm. of aligned with that side of my interests yep. i've always liked being able to visualize stuff and look at flows and see how things would work um so that was kind of i guess something that i was interested in didn't have the experience to contribute to like bitcoin core directly like like fanquake was who i was friends with so there was a graphical user interface which obviously like the end user application and um mm-hmm. The user experience of it is pretty pretty average. Like still it still is, but, but still by, is, by, yeah. kind of by design, I guess. But it's 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 one of those things where it's hard to. I know a lot of core developers kind of just want to scrap the, the GUI entirely and just kind of have <laughs> have it as like a protocol kind of thing, which in some ways I do agree with. Like I understand the motive, but it is also good to have like an end user application for Bitcoin Core. But um, yeah, I guess that, that's not really my fight that I'm fighting a whole lot for. It's kind of more up to the the hardcore maintainers. But yeah, I wanted to make the, the Bitcoin Core GUI. A bit more usable like mm-hmm. um it's it's not super it, it's it's reasonably feature rich but there is some limitations around some stuff and i went in a little pretty naive like you know for example i wanted to start in like get multi-sig into the the, the wallet because it it's the only and i think it still is the only like just simple desktop full node uh app you can run for bitcoin um but like because at the moment if you want to run a like you know full node you have to buy like an umbral and all that and that's quite mm. a big point of friction you got to buy a raspberry pi ssd and that's pretty expensive like if you just pop up yeah. the app on your computer that's good and with bitcoin core is the only one that does that but it doesn't have all the other cool features that these other mm-hmm. nodes can connect to wallets like you know unchained and uh uh what's the other ones like Casa and stuff like that um yep. so yeah i wanted to make it a bit more user-friendly one of those things was uh trying to you know push for multi-sig and just make it look nicer as well and there's a, there's a whole lot of uh friction points there uh bitcoin core like i'm sure you guys know moves very slowly it's a very um conservative project so things don't move that fast so i spent quite a lot of time working on stuff like that but stuff moved really slow um yep. so not a whole lot would get done and as well when it came down to like uh more like design related things which i guess can be looked at as more like subjective like it's not just like code uh a lot of the developers who i guess don't have just backgrounds in design i guess don't see the the benefit in doing that so yeah. it was a bit of an uphill battle but you know it was great because i got to spend a whole lot of time like talking to a lot of the developers who work on core and met meet mm-hmm. them and you know pretty much constantly followed like every pr and issue that would get posted on the bitcoin repo and really got to understand the kind of code base not in the, enough that i could develop on it but enough to like kind of know the ins and outs and how it works and stuff like that so even though i didn't really get to the point where i wanted to make this really nice gui and make it super user friendly which the uh, that project is kind of still in the works but i don't really work mm-hmm. on it um uh still got to have a great kind of learning experience and then uh Whilst working on that, um, obviously the Lightning Network came out, you know, like 2017, 2018, started rolling out, becoming popular in the last few years. And I really wanted to learn a lot more about that. Like I was reading about it, but uh, I like kind of making stuff to learn. So that kind of led me to reaching out to Evan Kaloudis, who is uh, uh, the main dev with Zeus or started Zeus, uh, the Lightning mm-hmm. Node Manager. Yep. And uh, he was looking for someone to help out with the front end because he'd done all the, the back end stuff like that. And he wanted someone to come in and make it look nice and uh, more u- have a better UX. So I um, reached out to him because uh, he posted something on Twitter and uh, ended up contributing to Zeus quite a lot. And in um, uh, tandem to doing this as well, I was also uh, the Bitcoin design community, which I'm sure you might have some questions. You can stop me if you want to mm-hmm. just like... Yeah, well, actually, I think 
is that there was a lot there. One thing I want to come back to, because I do appreciate the, the GUI in Bitcoin Core. Like, I don't think I could run a node if it didn't have a GUI, just like even trying to choose the right folder for me. is. Um, well, Daniel's a computer systems engineer. He thinks it's all pretty easy. But a question <laughs> I had, maybe uh, Daniel could help as well, is does the design part of it present a security risk at all? You know, because you sort of like, when they do the new versions, it's like you're getting all of the... Um, all of the functionality of Bitcoin Core, but does the design, like I guess, was there any pushback about the design causing any security risks? Uh, in some capacity, it, it can. Like, mm -hmm. um, I guess, like, it's not hardcore security uh, downsides, but I guess, like, you know, the way things are presented can make users ha make bad decisions and potentially lose Bitcoin and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Um, um, but there definitely was some things, like particularly in Bitcoin Core, like they use like hardened derivation paths. So they don't use like Bit39. They don't have recovery phrases, which was something when I initially went in and I was a bit naive about it and didn't understand. I was like, oh, well, like you guys don't use uh, Bit, uh, you know, Bit39 recovery phrases. But, you know, there's like six years of prehistory as to why that was so that I wasn't super aware of, which I right. learned very quickly. Um, but there is certain things like that where I was trying to like, recommend, like, you know, this would obviously be a great improvement on UX. Obviously didn't understand the whole security implications of that, but there was things like that that I was recommending that would have had downsides on security. Um, but it's all about kind of trade-offs. It probably wouldn't have made or mm. break things, but... Um, Hardened derivation just makes it a little bit less likely that someone will be able to like guess your private key from a public key um, yep. if they get access to your public key. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong with that, by the way, Daniel. I'm sure you're a bit more experienced than me, but that's know, kind of it in a nutshell. You've been, you seem to, you probably know more about this than me. But going to Jeremy's, I, I would guess the actual, for the most part, the code would be separate. The GUI mm. code, the actual core consensus code and stuff so it doesn't impact in that part i guess in presentation uh, yeah 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 that's true yeah yeah and and as well like um the, the the framework that generally the apps are built on like the gui at the moment uses like qt widgets which is like a bit of an old kind of um, framework that's a little bit outdated and it's, it's very limited on the design side so you can't really make that good looking apps with it and then the, the alternative version or the more modern version uses like qml which like uses a lot of like javascript engines and stuff like that which obviously introduces a lot more dependencies which like, can bloat things and that's obviously a huge security okay. issue but um there is a team working on like a more modern bitcoin core app using qml at the moment but yep. um i know there's a lot of stuff like on the back end that kind of needs to get worked out but I'd say maybe in a year there'll be a nice there'll be a nice Bitcoin Core GUI. I think at the okay. moment it's kind of branched off and it's kind of its own little project. And like once mm -hmm. it's been out in the wild and tested, it will be like more of like the official Bitcoin Core GUI. So it'll probably get out in the wild and tested a little bit, but it'll be running the Bitcoin Core pretty much. It'll be like a just okay. a nicer version of what the current GUI is. Maybe with multi sig too, which would be which would be really cool. Okay, but, cool. I look forward to because I use the GUI. Um, okay, so it was hard to tell on your profile, but so Zeus came before Spiral. Is that right? Um, I kind of in parallel. Um, okay. So I started Talk working on that. started working on Zeus, and then the Bitcoin mm -hmm. design community kind of started around the time same time. So Spiral kind of uh, spearheaded that uh, initiative. So. Mm -hmm. They don't run the community or anything like that, but they just kind of seeded some funds and got a few people together and said, you guys should do this. So the Bitcoin design community started up, which just in a nutshell, it's a open source uh, community for not just designers, uh, but pretty much anyone who's like building products. I would look at it as more of like a product builder community. The people mm -hmm. who are building like Bitcoin uh, open source related projects. Mm -hmm. and one of the biggest projects that um, the community there kind of works on is like a Bitcoin design guide. So similar to how you have like Apple interface guidelines and, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's it, what are the Android, Android, I forgot the name of it, Android uh, interface guidelines as well. Um, it was aiming to be that for Bitcoin uh, open source projects. Okay. Um, and that's one of the main projects they worked on. But there's a whole lot of other stuff now and the community is going to, you know, 3,500 plus people at the moment. And there's a whole wow. lot of stuff that's kind of happened over the years in there. But whilst I was working on Zeus, like I was obviously doing design stuff for them and I jumped, got really involved in that community, like sharing my designs because we did this all in the open, like designed in the open. Um, so shared a lot of our designs, met a lot of other designers who work in Bitcoin. Um, so it was very involved in that community from the early stages and, and, and I'm still very involved in that community. Um, so whilst I was working in Zeus, yeah, worked with that community quite a lot whilst it was getting off the ground. Do you think the Bitcoin okay. design community? 
Sorry, what was that, Andrew? You, you're, you're talking about the Bitcoin design community. Yeah, Bitcoin design community, yeah, which is like bitcoin.design for anyone listening to the website if you want to check it out. But, That's funded by Spiral. Uh, so a lot of the people who contribute to it have funding to work on it, but there is also lots of people who just contribute to it. It's all open source stuff. So the community is just a community, but there's a lot of projects that are built around the community. Some of those projects have people who are funded by Spiral, as well as actually a couple other organizations now. And hopefully there's more in the future that fund you know designers to work on projects. But um, the real aim was, yeah, to get a bit of design touch in the open source space in Bitcoin, which which is a pretty challenging thing to do. I think just in general in open source, like having design and UX is a hard thing to do. Um, it's, yeah, especially considering like designers don't have backgrounds like in using GitHub and understand how open source yep. stuff gets pushed through. So um, there's a big learning curve, uh, especially if you come from a pure design background or work in a conventional uh, yep. uh, company it's pretty challenging to jump into that but it's, it's it's really cool like it's great to have more people working in open source whether you're a designer copywriter whatever product manager developer it's all useful so it's very interesting to hear about some of those because it's the first time i've heard of this bitcoin design um community but the challenges of, of bringing them into an open source kind of um framework so let's just come back to zeus a bit so um if you listeners don't know the zeus is a lightning wallet um which you can uh, connect to your own node so it's um i guess probably the the best wallet for the hardcore bitcoin is, is that what attracted you to it or like why, why did you reach out to evan yeah, yeah. So that's kind of like similar to how I went straight into the deep end, I guess, with Bitcoin Core, with Bitcoin, yeah. but doing on-chain stuff. Like when I wanted to do Lightning stuff, I was like, oh, well, Zeus is the hardcore cypherpunk Lightning note wallet. And yeah. I, I, I was using it at the time. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. like, I'll, I'll jump into that. And I, I particularly wanted to work on like, you know, well, pretty much everything that's uh, open source is uh, non-custodial, but I wanted to work on a non-custodial product as well, uh, open source mm-hmm. stuff. But but yeah, Zeus, like, yeah, like you said, to uh, lightning node manager i guess i'd say more so so it's like an interface that can mm-hmm. connect to any lightning node implementation you want so it's like agnostic depending on what it can connect to which is a uh, really cool it's a it's a great product um but yeah it's definitely more targeted towards the more hardcore like cypherpunk people who want to manage nodes uh run stuff and things like that but it, uh, in saying that it still has like a nice kind of interface and it's reasonably mm-hmm. easy to use for the average person if they want to which is good because that kind of helps you know turn the average curious bitcoin owner into someone maybe a bit more hardcore so it kind of bridges that gap a little bit so yeah um, yeah, so Daniel's just, I haven't unfortunately set up my own uh, Lightning node yet, but uh, Daniel's just done that process and and, um, and got Zeus working. What was your experience like, Daniel? Um, yeah, I mean, Zeus itself, it's pretty simple. Um, like, so I, I like it. The main thing is just connecting to the actual Bitcoin node and setting it up. So Zeus is almost just like an interface layer, but... I was just experimenting. I connected to bit to sorry to Lightning Co. Um, so most of the problems was actually just setting up Lightning Co. And that's yeah. And Zeus is just a very simple layer that interfaces with it. Um, so yeah, I don't really have much. It works. It connects. Okay, well, that's good. It's good. <laughs> good. No, good news. Good news. And you can send and receive Bitcoin. It's actually like pretty simple. Do would you agree yeah. with that? Push. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's kind of like what I guess my job was to just come in, make it pretty simple to use, easy to use, and yeah, like it does have like you can get a little bit more complex with it if you want to. Like there is options to you know do everything that you can do with pretty much most uh, Lightning Node managers, like playing around with fees and stuff like that. I know Evan's also working on a bunch of other really cool stuff that should be rolled out in Zeus in the in the next year or so. Um, so yeah, it's it's it definitely can just be used in a pretty simple way. Like I know people who just don't know much about the technical side; they use it as a day to day wallet. Um, mm-hmm. I think the 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 most technical bit would be like sourcing like inbound liquidity and stuff like that, which you in most cases have to use like third parties but that's also improved quite a lot in uh the last year even just the last year like being able to get inbound liquidity from like companies like synonym and uh, ambosses magma and stuff like that but that's also that's a big challenge point but it's not like zeus's i guess problem to solve but it might do in no. the future there might be an easy way to just tap into some inbound liquidity uh, someday yeah. and so so what was your role on the project in terms of simplifying things? i was just so probably for me the 
I guess the only problem I had, which wasn't with the wallet itself, but I did have a little bit of trouble doing the actual connection between Lightning Core and Zeus. Um, I, I sorted it out. It was mostly my mistakes, but just connecting it. Mm. And because most of it, I found most of the documentation is more tailored to LND. Mm. So it, since I was doing Lightning Core, there wasn't as much documentation. Mm. And um, yeah, so yeah, I'm not sure because it's kind of like the interface. Who should, if somebody created a video or something, or some good documentation how to connect Lightning Core to Zeus, that might mm. be useful for some people. I'm not sure if that's Lightning Core, like, should Lightning Core do that or should you guys do that? But yeah, I know, I know, like, Open Noms a while ago, I don't, I'm not sure how much progress has been made on it, but he was talking about making a, a I guess like a standardized, not in a bit kind of standardized way, but just a standardized way to generate QR codes that um, make it super simple to uh, connect to Lightning nodes. Core Lightning was one. I think he actually opened a PR for it a while ago that's still open um, that just makes it pretty simple that you can create a QR code with the terminal with your Core Lightning node and you just scan that with Zeus and it connects you straight away and that's all you have to do. It yeah, works. That would, be, that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah, so I think it works pretty well. But um, another another friction point is Zeus that I, I know a lot of people have. I don't know if you were using it, uh, Daniel, but um, uh, connecting over Tor is uh, pretty oh. buggy here and there. I know a lot of people mm -hmm. have issues with that. But um seems tail scale if people use like Umbral and, um, you know, sit, run Citadel and stuff like that. You can use tail scale, which seems to connect uh, really smoothly. Hey, so in terms of that simplification, was that your main focus at, at Zeus or is your main focus? Like, what, 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 when you talk about designing there, what do you actually do? Like yeah, so it was pretty much pretty much purely design. So Evan had, you know, background in back end as well as doing front end, like the apps built in React Native. Um, so I pretty much did all the designs, which is in like, you know, using like the tool called Figma, which is what designers use. So pretty much mapped out all the, you know, the flows, like the user interface, uh, did all the UX side of it. And yeah, that's slowly kind of being rolled out as time goes on. There's still quite a lot of stuff in the Figma, which is actually open publicly and anyone can kind of oh, jump in and look at all the designs. So a lot of us in the Bitcoin design community, like design in the open, try to, even mm -hmm. though it's not like GitHub, we like to design openly. So anyone could happily just jump in and steal all my designs and use them if they want to. Like it's not like it's a, it's a secret. So yeah, it aligns a lot with that open design philosophy. But yeah, there's, there's quite a lot um, of stuff that's been designed that's still being kind of implemented and stuff like that. But Right, yeah. that's super interesting. So do you um, have like a special license behind your designs or are they just purely open source? Like how have you gone about that? Um, I think on Figma by default, uh, well, Figma anyways, I'm not too sure about other design tools. Everything you share is like, has just like a pretty uh, free use kind of similar to open source license. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not as uh, foolproof as a lot of the open source licenses you can use. But with Zeus anyways, like I don't really care if someone stole them. I'm not, it's not like, I don't know, like I don't like IP and stuff like that. The people are more yeah, than yeah. use it all and, uh, in, in whatever they, they want. But if you go on the GitHub, there's a link to the Figma page, which you can open your browser and, and look at it all and you can copy it all and play around with it and edit stuff, which is cool. But. Awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that out. Um, okay, like in terms of Zeus, like is it how many people work in for Zeus? Um, so mostly it was like there was me, uh, Connor, uh, who did a bit of the front end dev. Uh, he works at the TBC, the Bitcoin company as well, uh, and Evan. And then there was quite a few small contributors who were just like, you know, do test bugs and fix things here and there. But I guess we were the, or we are the three kind of main people who um, uh, work on Zeus and make it happen. But Evan's definitely the, the main guy. Like he was working on it since maybe 2018 or so, but um, okay. it's quite some time. But yeah, super small team. Very impressive, like I think what's being built um, mm. with such a small team. So, yeah, it's cool. I, I keep getting blown away by what gets produced by so few people. You know, this is something mm. that's going to compete with Visa and MasterCard one day. Mm. Um, and it's three guys built it. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Is this something like do you do this full time? Or um, oh, so yeah, I probably should have mentioned that uh, I guess going back a few steps related to the Bitcoin design community. So I got a, um, I got funded by Spiral uh, mm -hmm. about a year or so now to work on um, 
uh, Bitcoin open source pretty much full time. So part of that was, I guess, working on Zeus, but I guess it's pretty general. Like Spiral is really great. They're a great company. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, they're like a, a, a branch of, uh, you know, Block in that, in that kind of ecosystem who purely uh, fund okay. uh, Bitcoin open source developers and designers. So they fund a, a whole lot of great projects in the ecosystem. Um, but I was on like as a design grantee. So my guess goal was like in a nutshell would be pretty much, you know, uh, work on design related issues or UX related issues in Bitcoin uh, and make it better in open source Bitcoin uh, more specifically. So don't work on any like closed source stuff. It's all um, yeah, open source software or GitHub. So even though I don't do a whole lot of code these days, like on my GitHub, it's still super active, contribute a lot of projects to a lot of projects on there. Like whether it's, you know, everything from creating like resource doing documentation doing actual proper front end stuff like with zeus um yeah it's quite varied but there's there's a whole lot to be done in bitcoin open source as you can imagine and there's a very limited amount of designers who kind of work in this space as well and as well find designers who are bitcoiners as well is also an even smaller group of people so it's very similar to development too like it's, yeah it's a pretty small community but i think there's like maybe six or seven designers funded at the moment um, and they okay. work on uh, various projects uh, in the ecosystem. So, um, so, Zeus okay. is, so Zeus isn't like a funded thing. It doesn't pay you. It's just you're contributing there as a volunteer. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the funding from Spiral is not funded to work on Zeus. It's just, yeah, Zeus is purely, uh, uh, yeah, voluntary. Yeah. And is Pyro, is Pyro uh, does it is it actually a company does it do anything i don't know much about it oh no well it doesn't have any interest in making money it's like i guess you could it just gives away money i don't know i don't know the i don't know the company structure they have but yeah they, they're yeah. purely just to find okay. open source developers okay. so right. yeah. um you know there's uh like for example one of the big projects that spiral has kind of spearheaded and funded is like ldk and then uh the ldk is now used you know by like cash app Cash apps in the same ecosystem as uh, or umbrella as um, Spiral. So you have like Block and then you have uh, mm -hmm. Cash App, Square, uh, Spiral, stuff like that under that umbrella. Um, so even though they're not directly like making money by like funding developers uh, through Spiral to work on it, like a lot of their other projects uh, are, are benefiting from the open source work that is being mm -hmm. done. So there is like secondhand benefits from doing that, even though it's not direct. Um, it's still, I guess... I still, I think there is still incentives to do it. It's not just like I guess purely voluntary, but it's yeah, it's awesome what they do. It's it's yeah, it's great. It's very cool. Um, so your your grant was to um, add Lightning UX resources to the Bitcoin Design Guide. So what is the Bitcoin Design Guide first of all? Yeah, so it's like a I guess similar to what I kind of said earlier. It's like a guide similar in some ways to like Apple Human Interface Guidelines. Mm -hmm. It kind of helps designers. Uh, well, actually, a lot of people use it in different ways. So it can be pretty much a, it's got a lot of resources around how to build certain types of Bitcoin applications. Most notably, what's in there at the moment is how to build like a non custodial Lightning wallet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's a big kind of, I guess, uh, uh, reference design we have in there at the moment. So we have like the whole flows and, you know, how to do the onboarding, how to back up your recovery phrases, how to back up your Lightning channels. And it goes into all that detail. And it has all screen states and kind of goes through all the UX as well as has like quite a lot of the technical stuff kind of explained, but in explained in a way that's more in the context of a designer. So mm -hmm. our audience is like designers or product builders. So it's not like super technical documentation going into crazy stuff, but we do link off to that stuff if people want to read into it. So it's a guide that helps in a lot of ways, like from what I've found anyways, a lot of people use it to onboard into Bitcoin, particularly if they don't have a background in Bitcoin and they join a Bitcoin company. Like that, a, lot of the, a lot of Bitcoin companies these days um, will send those new design uh, employees to the design guide and be like, okay, go here. Here's pretty much all the foundational stuff you need to know and understand and um, et cetera. And they will kind of use it to kind of, I guess, understand the ropes and what kind of best practices are UX wise in the ecosystem and my kind of role was yeah uh, worked on the, that uh, uh lightning wallet reference design so which is a really challenging one especially non-custodial lightning because like there's a whole lot of really interesting ux issues with lightning for example you, you know you have to be online to receive payments you have to uh, uh mm -hmm. back up channel states regularly and if those channel states are out of sync you can lose your bitcoin so it's mm -hmm. a big issue um and yeah there's there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff that um still needs to be worked out um a lot of them are technical kind of hurdles that still need to be overcome but um 
yeah, there definitely is some like UX, uh, more front end stuff that needs to be dealt with. But it's going to be interesting over the next few years to see how like these non custodial Lightning wallets uh, uh, evolve. And um, so I'm just kind of in my mind, I'm thinking, it sounds to me like this is like mastering Bitcoin for designers. Because when I started here at Hubblock, Daniel gave me mastering Bitcoin to read. <laughs> this is how Bitcoin works. Um, but is that kind of an app description? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Not as technical, obviously, but um, yeah, it's it kind yep. of, it's like, yeah, like if you guys hired a designer at Hardblock, you'd be like, here's the Bitcoin design guys, like go read it and you'll know a lot about Bitcoin after. Like, okay. Because there's a lot of like um, uh, non, uh, so we have the references sections and stuff like that, which similar to like mastering Bitcoin goes into like how certain things work, but it's all in the context of like design. Like a page that I wrote recently in there or in the last few months uh, was um, like how LSPs work, like Lightning Service Providers. Um, their pretty much primary role is to abstract away all those complex UX issues that non-custodial Lightning has, like being having to be online, having to back up channel states and stuff like that. And LSPs are like a, a new thing that are kind of in the ecosystem now that will help a lot. And I think most non-custodial Lightning wallets will... Um, eventually adopt lsps there is some trust assumptions in using them and stuff like that but it's all non-custodial mm. still which is the main thing um but it's good like, i think it'll be a good way for open source developers like particularly like zeus as well um to be able to operate an lsp behind zeus as like a second kind of layer and it could be a way for them to earn some revenue uh and monetize mm. their open source work which would be really good yeah that would be very positive positive. and so like how do you know what to work on. like in this decentralized world like who, who is coordinating this design guide and how do you know what to you know how do you know what to do every day uh no one really <laughs> it's really similar to it's really similar to like open source uh yeah. software development so um i guess it all kind of like there is definitely some things that don't reach consensus and like you know there's a lot of back and forth there's a whole lot of discussions but that's the one thing that a lot of like well pretty much every open source designer that i know uh does is they generally will work on more than one project because mm -hmm. in open source obviously is going to have blockers and you have discussions that happen asynchronously because everyone's in different parts of the world and um like with me, I worked on the design guide, I'd work on Zeus, there'd be other like little small projects I'd have on the side or I'd be helping someone else out with their uh, uh, open source project or whatever it may be. So generally the best way to kind of go about it if you do want to get into like being an open source designer is don't just put all your eggs in one basket because it could be issues where there is roadblocks and the things aren't getting done because it's all voluntary and no one, mm -hmm. there's no like commander to be like, you know, you have to get this done today. So. Yeah, yep. you always want to have lots of stuff to do, and I've always, yeah, there's always, I've always found lots of work needs to be done in lots of different areas. So, okay, that's yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So, what, what's your kind of longer term focus then? Have you got other projects that you are kind of looking at? You, know, you don't mention designers like to juggle a few projects. Um, I guess none really specifically that I'm uh, working on so much now. Like I have been taking a big interest more in the uh, like on chain back going back to the on chain UX stuff. Like mm -hmm. really interested in kind of what Block's working on uh, with their uh, wallet that they're developing, and want to kind of work on potentially like a big reference design based around. Uh, that kind of product they're making to add to the Bitcoin design guide. So I guess in the next year or so, yeah, probably going to focus a lot on um, building out UX best practices for like on-chain, primarily multi-sig, kind of mm -hmm. more savings focused use case uh, type applications. Um, and with Taproot out now, like, you know, that enables a lot of really cool new features, but they're all pretty uh, new UX problems to solve as well. Like, for example, you have like, uh, you can use Frost with taproot now uh which kind of enables you to in a seedless kind of or in a multi-sig setup lens allows you to rotate keys within that multi-sig setup without making an on-chain transaction so like as a user like an end user particularly like and when i say end user i'm always talking about people who are just you know your mum and dad for example people don't know <laughs> yeah. anything about technology um, yep. they don't want to be exposed to all the complexities of what that means so abstracting that all the way particularly with bitcoin because there's a whole lot of trade-offs like in traditional fintech you could just be like whatever we're going to do this because you don't have to care you don't have to consider you know what um, implications it's going to have and if people are going to lose their money it's xyz or, or people can lose their money in traditional fintech but um, there's definitely a lot of trade-offs like you can't just abstract away everything and have people because that's just pretty much ends up being a custodial wallet in the end. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like there's a lot of interesting UX problems to kind of overcome then, and, and there's some stuff you just can't get around. So you need to, I guess, 
this also kind of goes more into like the copywriting and how you articulate things and you know how do you term certain things to make it easier to understand for an end user but also still be the most secure best way to kind of take a certain path within an application but there's a whole lot of those issues interesting issues in ux so as a product designer like working on ux like bitcoin's really 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 interesting to work on because yeah it's um a, a big balance of incentives and making sure you don't abstract away too much uh, yeah, because I mean, I did the product design for Hardblock, and often we'll get questions from customers like, you know, can't you just do this? I'm like, well, we wanted to do that, but it's not yeah. so simple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you, Bosch is not your real name. You're using a pseudonym. Um, is there a reason, like, what's driven you to do that? Um, I guess no particular reason. I wouldn't, like, I do, I am a big uh, privacy advocate. Uh, mm -hmm. But I guess there's a big distinction between like sort of privacy and secrecy. Like there's people who just completely want to be like anonymous, I guess you could say. Yep. Uh, but I think anonymous is pretty like relative kind of term. But uh, uh, yeah, like I, I just kind of did it because I, I grew up on the internet. Like I'm pretty young. I grew up on forums, message boards, and I was pretty used to having like a, a pseudonym. I would more, I think the, the word persona is probably more suitable. It's more of just like a your internet face. Like I wouldn't say... Bosch is my pseudonym because that implies that I'm doing it in a shady way. But like, I don't mind if people know who I am. Like, I'm being in public and I run my local Bitcoin meetup here and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I put my face to my name a lot. But yeah, Bosch just kind of started out when I joined the open source communities. Like, you know, everyone's got pseudonyms and stuff like that on there. And just kind of went with that. And it was based because I started doing the product design and I was a big fan of like Hieronymus Bosch, who's like a, you know, 16th century. Uh, uh, artist who does a lot of little, like gothic oh, okay. kind of art and stuff yep. like that and i liked him and so stole kind of that bosch name from that but yeah it's, it's not a huge thing but yeah privacy is important stuff like that yeah. and does it you know like recently the tornado cash developer was arrested um does that kind of change your views on the need for pseudonyms for you know people who work on bitcoin uh potentially i feel like uh most people, unless you like Satoshi Nakamoto or something, like I feel like most people could probably be anonymized, anonymized pretty easily. Uh, like, for example, like Hot or Not got found out pretty easily mm -hmm. his, through legal proceedings who he's actually was. So I don't, I don't think NIMS would really prevent um, regulatory capture in any capacity. Maybe to some degree um, they could help. Like they, add, they do add like I guess an extra layer of protection in some regards, but. With these things like security and privacy, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're generally on a big spectrum and depends on your threat model and who you are and what you're doing. And it's it's super hard to say if like, should you use a pseudonym or not? It's just like, yeah, I guess it's not as binary as that. Um, like for, you know, I could have a bunch of other pseudonyms and you could be talking to me on Twitter and other profiles, but I might not tell people like, you know, depends on my threat model and what kind of I'm okay with talking about under certain pseudonyms and et cetera, but yeah. I uh, said so you sign your Satoshi Nakamoto. Is that you have a pseudonym? <laughs> no, definitely not. I'm not that smart. Definitely not. He's too young as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, way too young. So, um, what was how did privacy stuff you? Is that something that came after Bitcoin or before? Um, I don't know. I kind of just when I got into tech, like, like I said, like I guess I was always like aligned with the whole libertarian kind of principles growing up. Um, in some weird way like my parents were pretty laid back like I grew up in a very rural country town so I feel like people who grew up in those areas generally have more like um, uh, I don't know like I wouldn't say like openness to experience is I guess the term you would use uh, mm -hmm. for people like that um, which generally kind of leads people down that path of being like I guess more libertarian minded and mm -hmm. one of those facets is privacy you know like I've you know I, well it is like your privacy is you know like a fundamental human right yeah i think it's important and as i was getting more and more into tech like i really seen like how much privacy is just being eroded um and i i don't think it's a really malicious thing i know a lot of people get into conspiracies and like xyz and the government's doing this intentionally like i think it's just technology has just moved way too fast for us to really keep up with um uh, making it kind of private like it's always mm -hmm. been a secondary fort and we haven't really caught up with the times a whole lot um but yeah like working in tech and stuff as well and like being in the tech world you really kind of see firsthand like the negative impacts that, of not having privacy can have in a digital world uh, particularly like things like uh 
uh, an example which isn't i guess directly privacy related is like you know kyc honeypots and stuff like that and just giving all your kyc yes. data to an exchange uh, to an exchange or, or any kind of service and Optus. then that's just a massive yeah Optus in australia yeah they got hacked and a lot of data leaked but i don't i didn't want to do that i didn't like that and i could see that having yeah could potentially have a lot of negative implications and i was always a pretty interested in like you know dark web and looking into that kind of side of the internet and you do you can easily just go on those those websites and buy people's full identities and be them essentially and then as the world gets more digitized like you could be them and get house loans in their name like that's just an example but that's all possible and happens on a regular basis and you know the fraud online industry is you know hundreds of billions of dollars I, I might be incorrect on that but i'm pretty sure it is um it's yeah it's something that's really important that people just kind of gloss over and people usually only care about it once it's gone so i just didn't want to be the, one of those people to lose my privacy and then be like oh crap you know i should have done more to <clears throat> protect it yeah it's amazing for us where's the guy at our bitcoin meetup in adelaide who um someone impersonated him and set up a company and then committed crimes but yeah. then he was then on the hook for those crimes he had to go to court and defend himself so it's yeah it, it's it is a it is a risk yeah it's like insurance kind of it's like you know being private it's like kind of like a form of insurance you can think of so are you like a full-on kind of calyx os kind of guy or like how, how far have you taken it uh yeah i got a graphene os phone so like i got it okay. i got like an iphone here um which for work wise like doing product design like i like iphones they're great ux and stuff like that um but i do have like a graphene os phone that i use for like testing uh android apps um for design stuff as well as just testing android apps in general like bitcoin related ones mostly um and i do have a calyx os phone i did use calyx os full time for almost a year um but ended up going back to the iphone uh just yeah it's they're, they're really good so i wanted to move back but not super hardcore in that regard but outside of that like yeah like i you know i use proton mail for my calendar I use Pro- or proton now I use proton mm-hmm. for calendar email calendar uh drive uh email uh vpn um and do a whole lot of other i guess privacy best practices like you know use certain browsers and have certain browser extensions and i know i i, I mentioned earlier to Jeremy and Daniel, I use Windows, but I do have a laptop as well with Linux, which I, yep. you know, I run. That's what I run uh, my Node on, and uh, I, I do a lot of other stuff on, uh, on there as well. Like generally, if I'm doing any like terminal or like uh, uh, work like that, I'll use that. But I generally just SSH from my desk Windows desktop into the uh, Ubuntu laptop that I have, and, and just work yep. from my Windows laptop. It's a bit easier, but. You know, you can't play games on Linux, so it's not as good. Okay. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I don't have time for games. So I didn't realize that about Linux. <laughs> so on your on your website, where most people have a email address, if you go to contact you, it says um, it's got a public PGP key. So tell us why is that there and how do you use it? Um, I guess it's more there. It's not there's the main way to contact me. I think you can import into an app, and it has my email address tied to it. I'm not too sure. I actually can't remember if I put my email on it, but um, I guess it's just a way for pre- people who do want have that extra security and privacy with their messages if they want to message me i don't have a whole lot of people messaging me by the way i just kind of made that website recently so it's just kind of sitting there but yep. it's just an it's an option i think it's good to have that there as an option like even even you, like you can you can put your pgp key into facebook and all your communications between you and facebook will be pgp encrypted like you can do right. stuff like that in those apps right. and it's good to have it as an option for those who do want to use it so it's more there for other people and for myself but i also think yeah. it's just really cool i like using pgp it's interesting stuff to use um so um yeah it's just nice to have there as an option if people want to use it so for somebody who doesn't understand it like me how would you actually use it um well, just using like PGP still, like it's been around since like 90s now, so it's been around for a long time, but there's not a whole lot of real nice graphical user interfaces to mm-hmm. kind of deal with PGP. And even the ones that do exist are a little bit clunky, but like uh, pretty much simply put, like, you know, you, you have to get an application, you generate a public private key pair, you obviously back your private key up, very similar to how you do with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin uses like the same kind of, you know, graphic primitives mm-hmm. behind the scenes. Um, back up your private private key you share your public key manually with people so with bitcoin like the uh, public uh, your address which is like a hash of your public key kind of gets shared like um you can just share that with someone um manually similar with pgp you have to share your public key manually with someone and that lets them 
uh, encrypt any piece of uh, data, generally just plain text or uh, you know text in like a Word document or something, with your public key. And then um, the only way that you can, and it generates out this big kind of big string of numbers, it's really ugly. And then uh, they send that back to you and uh, you can use your private key to decrypt that. And generally when you're using PGP, it's just like an end user, it's pretty manual and you do that manually. But tools like, you know, Proton, like I mentioned earlier with their mail, they had like open PGP, which is like open PGP library inbuilt to the uh, mailing uh into their software stack, which does what I just explained, but uh, automatically. Um, but the way I have it set up on my website, you have to do that manually. You have to copy that uh, that public key and co- import that key into your uh, whatever kind of software tool you're using. There's quite a lot. Um, and then use that key to encrypt a message and then send that encrypted message to me manually over some kind of secure communication channel. Well, generally, actually, you'd, you'd send encrypted stuff over non-secure communication channels. That's probably the best time you'd want to so, yeah, I don't know if that explained it that well, but yeah, it was a, it, to me. In my mind, I was seeing this metaphor for what you're trying to do in Bitcoin, and and you know, Proton has solved that for PGP because the reality is not many people are going to use PGP in the way you mm. just described. But like my mum and dad could use Proton Mail, um, and if people like you are out there helping create products that my mum and dad could use on Bitcoin, then that's going to open up Bitcoin to just so many more people than you know, just the Cly and Bitcoin Core, you know, in the terminal. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I definitely think we need more designers working on UX problems in Bitcoin. It's, it's like a. I know there is a lot of like, like developers who are a little bit like if you would design, they like think it's maybe not that important. But you know, look at Ethereum, they do and stuff like that, and a lot of web free yes. projects. They they do they do a really good job when it comes to UX and user interfaces, and in some way, that's why they are so successful. But Again, like going back to that, <laughs> yeah, like going back to that point I made earlier, like they've abstracted away too much stuff with the UX yeah. and they've compromised yeah. their principles and their underlying like foundations, which is really bad. So if you're going to work on Bitcoin and design, make sure you really understand that you can't do that. Because people no, do, definitely. they do, they come work in the space and they're like, oh, let's, we'll just do this like this. Like what I said earlier, like I, I worked on Bitcoin Core and I was like, oh, we should just use, you know, recovery phrases on Bitcoin Core. And I didn't understand the whole reason as to why you wouldn't um but you know that's years worth of back and forth debates on github that i just didn't have the context mm-hmm. of and hadn't read so you know but a lot of the developers were super nice and walked me through it and i learned the ropes eventually that that story makes me think of what vitalik was probably going through when he proposed like, effectively ethereum on bitcoin um and he went and tried to do it in his own way and made a mess of it but you've kind of understood and been patient and, and stuck it out in bitcoin which is really cool yeah yeah it's kind of the same thing yeah and for any guys got guys who don't know vitalik was contributing to bitcoin core like very early days and wanted to change things and add all these fancy emvs and smart contracts and stuff like that and yeah the bitcoin core developers pretty much said no so and he had a cry when it made ethereum so. um before we wrap up daniel have you got any questions um Oh, maybe just how's the Perf Bitcoin meetup? So are you the organizer of the, are you? Yeah, so I'm the organizer of the Perf Bitcoin only meetup. Um, we actually, I just got back uh, yesterday morning from a, we did a bush bash uh, out down south. Yeah. So a couple <laughs> hours drive from here. Had a bit of a, yeah, there's probably like 20 or 30 people there. We generally have like, wow. there's probably have like five or 10 regulars that come to our meetup. Um, uh, but yeah, there's like 20 or 30 people down there. We got a lot of people local farmers and stuff because obviously there's a lot of overlap with like you know mm-hmm. carnivore of generative agriculture and a lot of like fringe yep. topics like that with bitcoin so we had people like from those backgrounds come and do talks and got to meet them and a lot of overlap in our interests but yeah it was a really good weekend so we um yeah just hang out we drank some beers and talked about bitcoin for like two three days which is which is awesome but um but yeah there's actually there's a few guys in perth now there's uh, Pete is another guy who works at our, um, comes to our meetup. He's uh, uh, the product lead at Fetty now, so the new Fetty company that just came out the last few months. So he's working there. Like I said earlier, like Fanquake, uh, he's around too. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a good group of dudes. Did you get any interstate uh, attendees for the your Bush Bash? No, nah, unfortunately. No. It was, um, <laughs> we, we had some people who were interested, but um, we did plan it um, quite last minute so yeah there was some people i know there was some talk like i haven't been following these convos as much as some of the other people in the group but someone was saying they wanted to do like a train trip like get fly everyone over to like queensland 
every, all the Bitcoiners get on a train or something and we all just hang out on the train and drive to WA on the train and talk about Bitcoin while we're on the train. I don't know. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, that sounds a bit funny, but I guess it'd be fun. <laughs> Well, I think uh, we need an SA one because most of the other states have their own now, so we could probably need to work on that. Yeah. Cool. Well, is there, um, if would you want to share your details to, if people want to contact you? Is that something you're keen to do? Or Yeah, sure. Um, or- primarily on Twitter. I'm on there quite regularly. Like uh, my tag, my name on there is Doc Sharp, uh, but my tag I think is at underscore Bosch underscore. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, you're more than happy to follow me on there. Got my DMs open if you want to talk about stuff. I'm always happy to talk about lightning, privacy, whatever, anything related to Bitcoin. Pretty keen to talk about. But but yeah, that's my main thing. And I think I got, I got a website as well, which I don't really use a whole lot. I'm planning to do a bit more writing and stuff on there. But yeah, it's like docsharp.xyz for anyone mm-hmm. interested. But that's on my Twitter as well. So Awesome. Well, I mean, it's an amazing story, and I, particularly the bit where you just bypass most of the shitcoin phase and just, and have been working on on Bitcoin and just making, you know, it sounds like you're pretty self taught um, mm-hmm. to get from there to where you are now is is really awesome, and also just working on a product that I think probably our grandkids will use um, mm-hmm. to to pay for their stuff, yeah, is mm-hmm. something that's really awesome. So, well, thanks heaps for joining us, um, and yeah, well, we'll hope to hear what what you get up in in future. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks. thanks.